Greetings, I am Tantus Naravan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome! It's time to talk about AD&D, once again. It's time to talk about Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and continue talking about this older system, which, you know what? I wouldn't mind playing again. That's the truth about it. I wouldn't mind playing it again. And today we're going to go into the classes. Now for the classes, there are the classic archetypes. It's Fighter, Mage, Thief, and Cleric. These are the four that are the quintessential archetypes for any sort of character. They've lasted in some version across all the systems, and really they do. In AD&D, they link to groups of classes. The fighter links to warrior, the mage links to wizards, the thief links to rogues, and of course the cleric links to priests. And there are these groups of classes. There's three warrior classes, three mage classes, two rogue classes, and two priest classes, so there's a total of nine classes you can choose from, and I'll get into each of them. The first thing you're going to have to think about is that each of these classes actually does have an ability score minimum. Just like with races, you have to qualify to play a class. Now there is something you can do. If I really want to play a paladin, let's say, and I'm missing one ability score, I can either get my GM's permission to raise that score to the minimum I need, or to re-roll it. Or, you can get your GM's permission to reroll all your stats. If you needed a lot to qualify for Paladin and you have really bad stats, you can get your GM's permission to reroll all of them and hope for the best. Granted, you might not get it again, but it's the same way of rerolling one of your scores. You might not get it again, it's just giving you a little bit permission. And the thing is, again, the GM also might have you take that minimum if you should roll higher than it, because he's giving you that advantage of a reroll. So if I needed a 14, and I luckily roll an 18, he still might have you take a 14, depending on what he feels like in that point in time. If he thinks like you've got a lot of other high ability scores to begin with, if you don't, he might have you keep that. If you do, he might change that. It's going to depend on a lot of circumstances, especially if you're trying to gun for this class. You're going to have to try to discuss things with G your GM if you don't qualify for it. And there's reasons to gun for classes. Maybe you want to balance out the party. Maybe you know all the classes your friends are taking and you want to take something that works well with them and doesn't step on people's toes. Then you might want to consider that. At the beginning of each class group, let's say for example Warrior, it will have a chart telling you how much experience you need for each of these classes to gain a level in it. Now this is something that's different from later editions, which I'm going to mention now. In this early edition, you needed different experience points for different classes to gain those levels. Something like a fighter needs less experience than something like a mage to gain a level in it. It was a way of balancing out the power you gained, which was sort of seen as being different. More modern systems, same experience, same levels, but in this past time, you needed different amounts. Now this chart also tells you what kind of hit dice you gain and any bonuses and stuff. For example, the warrior group, you get D10s up to ninth level. That's something I'm going to mention right now because we're going to be talking about the warrior group. For those first nine, you also gain your constitution bonus to hit points, which it will note in the constitution chart. After that, you no longer gain the constitution bonus, you no longer gain hit dice, you just gain three hit points level up until 20th. You get an extra 33 down here at the bottom of the chart. Now each class will tell you at the beginning of it the ability scores required, prime requisites, which are the most important ability scores to your character. There might be prerequisites for your character that aren't that important when it comes to actually playing the character. That's something you have to think about, is the fighter, it only needs a little bit, but like the paladin needs a lot of ability scores to qualify for it. When there's a lot less ability scores, you need to actually play it. It's just it has this qualification. And then also each class will mention what races qualify for it. So today, as I said, we're going to talk about the warrior classes. There are three of them. I'll talk about the other class groups in other videos, but I'm just talking about the warrior ones now. So at the beginning of the warrior section, there is a little chart which tells you as you level, you get extra attacks, and it will inform you how the attack chart breaks down. Then you get up to two, extra, to two attacks a turn. So let's start talking about the fighter. The fighter really just needs strength. Any race can have a fighter. It's the sort of universal class. And the big thing a fighter gets as it levels is followers. They have an entire chart that tells you about these followers that you get that you can use how you wish as your character. So after fighter is paladin. Now a paladin has four ability score requirements, and it only has two ability scores that are really important to it. The two important ones are strength and charisma, and only humans can be a paladin. 
Paladins get a lot. They get healing abilities, curing abilities, de abilities to detect evil. They get bonuses to saves. They get immunity to diseases. They get a war horse that they can summon and use. They get priest spells at higher levels. They get a lot of stuff, but then they also have requirements. They have limits on the amount of wealth they can have, the amount of magic items they can have, and in their behavior that you have to follow these strict rules in order to get all these abilities. So the last one I'm going to talk about today is a ranger. A ranger also has four prerequisites, but it has three ability scores which are very important. Strength, dexterity, and wisdom. There are only three races allowed to be a ranger. Now rangers get percentages to hide in shadows and to move silently. As they level up they get higher. They also will eventually get some priest spells. They get some limited animal empathy that they can understand animals. They get the ability to build fortresses. And they get followers when they get high enough level. And their follower list is different than the fighters. They get less followers, but they can choose from not only people, but certain animals. Normally you'd roll, but it's dependent on your GM too. He might just give you a selection of them, or have you select them. But it's not just people. It's also animals and certain foresty fae creatures, and a couple other things that would kind of fall under the ranger's purview of nature. Now, ranger also has a code of belief you have to follow in order to be one. Now, I'm going to stop here for today. I don't want this video to go too long. But when the wizard group which is next, this video would go on for a while. I will talk about some more stuff next time, more on the classes, break down a whole bunch more. Anyway, if you have any questions about the classes, it's specifically the ones I talked about today in AD&D, leave them in the comments below, or any other sort of questions or comments about AD&D itself. If you enjoyed this video, please like it. Please share it with people. Let people know about this video so they can too can learn about AD&D or other topics if they're interested in my other videos. Subscribe if you already haven't. We're always looking for more citizens of the Empire. Join us. Become a member. Share with the experience. And until the next time, I bid you farewell.